to reckon with that we can't cover um, within our operating budgets when we're running at a deficit. Okay, um, I have um, noticed some of what's in the chat. Um, I guess the, the last slide there was questions, which we're going to get to a little bit later. Um, I want to I want to add a couple of other things. First, um, alumni have been very consequential in helping Mills with enrollment. Many of you out there are storied recruiters, and you have made a difference for Mills. And I know how much I, I know how much that matters to you. I just want to recognize that you make a tremendous difference because of your example and your success, your accomplishments in connecting to the people who could come to Mills. Uh, the uh, the um, the enrollment challenge is a structural issue. It's not, it's true, every institution is in a different place, but the number of opportunities that are out there um, to continue to re recruit students to the kinds of programs that Mills have, we have tried everything in the book that's out there. We have also worked to raise money to support all of these programs with, with as much vigor as possible. And we have, um, we have worked to uh, share with our community these challenges. Uh, I went back a few years to right before I came. So since I came to Mills, we have always been in financial struggle. Um, a, not a year after I arrived, we declared a financial emergency. And as soon as I arrived, uh, we immediately made cuts. I was deciding on cuts before I even got to campus when I was still had a different job and I was coming to Mills to try to figure this out. We made cuts just to bring our deficit under what our line of credit was for the year. And those were difficult cuts for our campus community to sustain. They involved reducing benefits. They involved reducing salaries in many instances. They, they involved um, uh, changes that made it tough for the campus to continue to operate. We made those changes because we believed in Mills' mission. And we, we eventually declared a financial emergency to try to restructure in ways that we thought could help Mills continue to sustain itself into the future. In the years since that, uh, that declaration of financial emergency, we regularly shared budget uh, and financial information with all of the media meetings that we had with all of our stakeholders. During the years before I got here, an average of, um, that is sort of 2014, 15, and 16, a message went out to the campus community on average about every week and a half about Mill's financial situation, um, usually, usually titled budget deficit, but sometimes titled different things. So I, this is a decision that's a long time coming, and a lot of information has been out there about it. It's been exacerbated by the pandemic, and, and the, the situation that Mills finds itself in right now is actually beginning to reckon with the reality that caring for our current student, staff, faculty, and mission is something that we need to, we need to change the way we're operating in order to sustain Mills into the future. Uh, I wanna mention um, the, the conversations that we're having with Berkeley too. So Nicole, I realize I'm running a little bit long here. Um, uh, should I um, should I start to should I talk a little bit more? Or do you want me to start answering questions? It's up to you. I don't want to cut short the time that we have for questions, and I could go ahead and introduce Katie right. Um, I think if you want to speak for a few more minutes, and then we'll go right over to Katie. All right, we're heading to our uh, the chair of our board of trustees shortly. So, Katie, I'm just going to say a few words about UC Berkeley, and then I will shift um, over to you. So, I want to acknowledge that many of you don't feel we shared enough about our financials, um, our financial situation. I recognize that's um, it's a challenging thing for people to hear. It's also uh, something that causes us sometimes a competitive disadvantage um, in terms of recruiting and other, um, other activities of the college, including our relationships with partners and creditors. So this is a tricky balance and we've sought to, to strike that. And, um, and we're certainly sharing as much as we can right now. The same information with you that we share with our staff and faculty, many of whom have been in budget conversations with us year after year about these very issues. I also want to acknowledge that many um, alumni don't feel that they've been included in the process. So we do have elected members um, of our, our board of trustees who are, um, who, who are part of the alumni association, our alumni trustees from the board of governors. They have been part of these discussions. And also I realize you wanna hear, be heard more at this point. It's why we've set up listening sessions so that on April 22nd, before there's any additional action on this path that we've set out, um, April 22nd, we'll have an opportunity for trustees to hear from everybody. I also want to say our conversations with UC Berkeley continue. And I am aware of this, uh, of the, the um, interest out there in a UC Mills. I want you to know that we appreciate the effort to come up with creative solutions. And I'm very grateful for that. And we do continue to have conversations with UC Berkeley. And I, um, I am open to the possibilities that many different partnerships might bring to Mills College to allow us to continue elements of our mission as are our board of trustees. We have cultivated UC Berkeley as a potential partner for a very long time now. 
pulling our faculty in at the very start with a retreat last spring, the first pandemic spring, not the second pandemic spring, but the first one. We then actually engaged in extensive conversations about possibilities and we continue to do that. We've, we've, we've generated lots of ideas. The UC Mills idea is not an idea um, that, that is feasible given what we know about um, the political, the legal, the financial possibilities. Um, we have discussed the idea of Mills being in college within UC Berkeley and we determined it was not possible. Uh, this, the UC isn't in a position, that is the UC system, isn't in a position to undertake that tremendous effort and it would take multiple years um, and it would have lots of cost implications. And honestly, we need to move quickly and we, we need to find resources to support a sustainable Mills moving forward. We're longtime partners with UC Berkeley we look forward to sharing more as things develop. And we have been forthright with our community about those conversations as they've continued. Okay, so why don't I pause there? And um, Nicole, I'm going to introduce Katie then. So Katie Sanborn is the chair of our board of trustees. I'm grateful for, for her accompanying us on this journey. And um, Mills has been fortunate to have her leadership during this time. Katie. Thank you, Beth. Uh, you know, I've been looking at the the chats here and I've been looking at your faces and I honestly wanted to scroll through all 30 pages, but I was afraid I wasn't going to get back in time to, to be able to speak to you this way without looking like I don't know what I'm doing on Zoom. Um, I've, I've, I'm a class of 83. Uh, I have served as a trustee since 2014 and I've served as chair of the board for the last four and a half years. And what I wanted to talk to you about uh, to you this evening was how the board is structured and how we came to this decision. And also just share with you a little bit of my own uh, personal experience. I was talking with my brother-in-law um, the other day and he is he's aware of what's happening to Mills at Mills and what we're looking at doing. And he says, you know, I think of all the people who love their college and I can't think of anybody who loves her college more than you do. And I wanted to share that with you because Mills is a very special place to me and it, it colors everything that I do and how I think as a trustee and how I lead our board. Um, our board has 25 voting members, 68% of us are alums and that includes the AAMC elected alumna trustees. One of the things that's incredibly important to me is that all of the members of the board, all of the trustees, when we come together in that boardroom, we are equal. I do not dis distinct, uh, distinguish between who's an alumna, who's not an alumna, who's coming from another uh, background. I don't distinguish who's came through the AAMC election process. Uh, I don't distinguish who has been on for six months or who's been on for multiple terms. And we have people that fall into both of those categories. When we sit down at that table, we wrestle with the issues that we're bringing forward to you this evening and that you've been reading about in these last weeks. So I just want you to know that we take all of this incredibly seriously. Um, we represent a wide range of disciplines. We have people whose backgrounds are in finance, government, law, real estate, academia, nonprofits, marketing, and some other um, areas as well. We all love serving Mills. It doesn't matter whether uh, we're coming as alums or whether we're coming from outside. I, I actually, some of our trustees who never attended Mills or never had family members attend Mills are some of our most passionate supporters of the college. Um, so structurally the way we work is we have a, a number of committees. Uh, the committees take on the college's matters uh, both from things that we have a, a fiduciary responsibility for uh, through some strategic issues. So we look at things at academic and student success and finances and resources. Uh, we have an audit committee. We uh, address external communications or external relationships, which includes philanthropy and working with partners outside of the college, whether it's in the Oakland community or elsewhere. Um, and then we bring all the work that we have done as in our committees to the, the general board, the full board for broad discussion about these topics. And then we take votes when is required and, and we take those things very, very seriously. I, it's like, it's hard to really explain it, but the, we care. 
And I guess that's, we care so very, very deeply. And I, I know that you are all um, struggling with this. And I just want you to know that this is not a decision that the board has come to lightly and it certainly hasn't come overnight. As Beth pointed out, we Mills, and you, you know this too, Mills has been struggling with, with this for decades. Um, and we've come to the point that we realize that Mills to sustain our mission and to try to carry on all of the things that we love and the, the mission that we have, it's time for us to pivot. And that pivot is to find a new path. And I think about our motto that we all know, and I see this as a new path. So during my time on the board, as Beth just outlined, we've considered all sorts of ways to make Mills sustainable in its current uh, form. Uh, we've had to grapple with and then vote on the financial emergency that she talked about. Uh, and we continue to work with these things. We have been meeting more frequently in the last year so that we can provide the support and do more investigation on all of these issues uh, than we were doing before uh, things got to this point and prior to the pandemic. So, you know, one of the things I also want to leave with you again, just to, to underscore how much I personally care about Mills. My, my grandmother was over the moon um, that I was admitted to Mills and, and went to Mills. And after she passed away, I had an opportunity to establish a, an endowed scholarship in her name so that other students could experience what I experienced at Mills. Um, and I know many of you have done that as well. So I speak to you not only as a trustee and not only as the chair of the board, uh, but as a fellow alumna, and I also believe that this is our best path forward. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce you to our trustee and alumna, Marilyn Schuster, and our professor, Awan Mance, who will tell you a little bit more about the Mills Institute that we're envisioning. Marilyn? Oh, okay. Um, Awan and I are going to first introduce ourselves a little bit. Um, I'm a Mills alumna, class of 65. Um, and my experience at Mills really shaped my whole life. Uh, I, for, for 40 years, 40 plus years, I was on the faculty at Smith College. And for five of those years, I served as provost and dean of the faculty. When I retired in 2015, I moved back to Oakland and was fortunate enough to become part of the board, a group of people who are really remarkable in their backgrounds and in their commitment to the college. And I'd like to, to um, before one uh, introduces herself and, and talks about specifics of a process that we've developed to get maximum input on, on designing the Mills Institute, I'd like to take a minute to consider the broader context of higher education in this country. That we, um, we tend to see only where we are in our institutional place, but financial problems concerning the funding of higher education, especially in the private sector, and enrollment shifts because of changing demographics have had a profound effect on all colleges in this country. And the um, and COVID has just been the stress test that has been kind of the last blow for a lot of institutions across the country. Many colleges have closed altogether. They no longer exist in any shape or form. Many colleges have abandoned their mission and changed drastically who they are and what they do. I think that, that what Mills has is deciding to do is actually quite an inspiring and interesting opportunity to, to continue the mission, to continue the values of Mills in a different institutional structure so that it, continue, it will continue to exist and that it will continue to have an influence in higher education. So I just want to, to remind us that many, many things have been tried at Mills. Many things have been tried elsewhere that we have learned from but it's come to the point where we really have to be more creative, more visionary, and create new institutional structures. 
So Awan is going to tell you a little bit about the, um, the process that we've developed to reach out broadly and think deeply about how to define the Mills Institute to continue our mission. Thank you. Um, and if I, I hope you can hear me okay, I've been having a little bit of sound uh, trouble today. Um, but my name is Alon Mance, and I've been at Mills as a faculty member since the fall of 1999. And I am in the English Department and Ethnic Studies. I'm a professor of English and Ethnic Studies. I specialize in 19th century African American literature, but I also am an artist and an illustrator. And I am also teaching digital drawing in the art department. Um, and so I fill your faces. Hello, it's really great to see um, great to see so many familiar folks, um, but of course for a uh, sad reason, but hopefully a hopeful reason um, as well as we talk about this way that we are trying to advance the mission and preserve that in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, I've been at Mills for, um, let's see, am I having a sound issue? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Juan, I was trying to pipe in. Um, do you want to try turning your video off for a second? It might help. Okay, is that better? Oh, yes. Great, excellent. Um, and so, um, you know, as someone who um, is not a Mills alum, but has been at Mills for an awfully long time, um, you know, I understand, Marilyn and I both understand that Mills is close to the hearts of any many people, and Mills belongs to um, a lot of people. There's a broad constituency, um, faculty, students, staff, alumni, trustees, um, the, the Oakland and Bay Area communities have a deep investment in the meaning of this college. And so as we move forward, you know, what we're engaging, Marilyn and I are engaging in, or at least we're leading a process in which um, the Mills community will help us shape the mission and the goal, or particularly I suppose the implementation of a Mills Institute and the vision for that institute. And so I just wanna talk briefly about the, the vision process for that. Um, and um, we're going to put together small groups of alums, faculty, students, staff, and trustees to have in-depth hour long conversations with us about the design of the Mills Institute. And we're going to address questions um, like, um, what have been the experiences that have been the most meaningful for you? Um, what is, has been very special and what has been most valuable for you in your Mills experience? And also how would you like to see this institute continue the commitment of the college to advance gender and racial justice and women's leadership? Um, those questions, um, we're going to just engage, have some good conversations. And we want, we realize, you know, there are 700 plus people here today. And so we will not be able to speak individually with every part of every constituency, but we will be taking all of the, taking notes at all of these sessions and we will be making those, those notes public so that everyone, all parts of the community will be able to know at least in some way, know what's happening, what's being discussed, what ideas are being thrown, um, put on the table with each constituency as we talk with different groups about what this Mills Institute um, should look like, what the design of this institute should be. We wanna hear your thoughts and, um, and processes. And we also have created, um, uh, well, I won't say we, but uh, the president's office was uh, kind enough to create an email address uh, for the whole Mills community to share ideas about the institute as we move forward. We want an open process, we want input, um, we want your ideas as people who love this institution and care deeply about Mills. You know, I'll just um, conclude with a, a couple of uh, comments. Um, as, as Awan said, and as Katie said also, the goal is to continue the mission in an institutional structure that can last and that will serve serve both uh, Mills legacy and also uh, education going forward. So gender and racial justice, women's leadership, access and success for underserved communities are the values and the, the vision that will be shaping the Institute with your help and your input. And I really want to urge you to keep your minds open and keep your imagination alive. This is an incredible opportunity for us to create something new.
Thank you, Awan. Thank you, Marilyn. All right. So we're going to dive into questions that came in during the registration process. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of questions to get through. Um, we will try to take questions from the chat, but please hold those questions until the end. We want to focus on the Q&A, and then if we have time, uh, we'll definitely try to answer you know, the questions that we can. So with that, um, Beth, most of these questions are for you, um, of course, and then I have a few questions for Marilyn and Awan as well, but I will just dive right in. Um, so the first question that came in, um, what is the dollar amount to save Mills as an independent women's college? This would be the cost of bringing it out of the red and to keep it on steady ground for the future. This is a tough number to estimate, Nicole, because it's based on so many different pieces. However, I'd say we'd need, according to estimates that um, others have made that I, um, that I have seen, and that are based on what we would need in order to be on, on, on in a better place. We'd need 500 million to $1 billion. Could a major fundraising campaign involving alumni enable the college to overcome its financial problems and keep Mills an independent women's college? I want to be clear how grateful Mills is for all the support of its incredibly generous alumni, um, alums, and other donors out there. Uh, the financial situation facing Mills though is an ongoing structural operating deficit resulting in large part from declining revenues related to enrollment um, and the critical need to invest significant money in repairing and upgrading the infrastructure that supports our academic operations. The financial issues that are facing Mills can't be solved by a fundraising campaign because they're based on what our current donor base is uh, and how much we get for instance on a regular basis because they're not one-time occurrences, uh, they're ongoing and they're fueled by the dramatic changes across higher education. Let me just put out there, Nicole, one of the, um, one of the uh, comparisons that people ask about this is um, what about Sweetbriar College? So Sweetbriar College um, did change its plans um, because of a fundraising campaign. Sweetbriar has about 12,000 living alums. They, on a regular basis, they get in unrestricted giving, um, they get between $5 million and $15 million every year in unrestricted gifts. Mills um, unrestricted gifts um, uh, have never hit $5 million. Um, our unrestricted gifts um, generally are our goal each year. And I wanna thank uh, those of you who don't think Mills is fundraising. I can tell you they're working very hard to raise money. And I'm grateful for everybody who's working in our advancement office to do this. And they've worked very hard and they've actually met their goal for unrestricted um, uh, uh, funds that they've raised this year, which are going right to support our operations and current students and our academic, um, our academic goals. And I couldn't be more, more grateful for everybody who's contributed to that. But there's just not the capacity in our donor base to actually raise enough money to do this. The challenge for us is, um, is, a, is just the, um, the, the extent of the need far outpaces the, um, the, the amount. The campaigns that we've run have not been able to hit that. One of the differences between Mills and some of the other institutions that are out there is a difference in our endowment size. If we had 10 times our endowment, we would be in a, we would be in a much different financial place. Thank you. Um, what is Mills 2021 endowment payout rate set at and why is it set at that percentage? The endowment payout rate is set each year by the board of trustees. It's subject to change. They decide the rate based on the rate of inflation and other economic factors. The college's payout rate um, had been brought down to 5%. It was moved back up because of the financial pressures related to COVID-19. Um, came back up to 7%. So the board raised the payout rate from the endowment to 7% as I put on the, um, on the slide earlier um, for, uh, for the three fiscal years that we're in the midst of right now. And this next question we get a lot, especially recently, um, what happens to the unspent endowment fund if the college does decide to suspend business as an accredited college? What input will we have if we begin and or contributed to a fund? So just to be clear, Mills is, is, um, is be at the beginning of what we intend to have as a compassionate and meaningful transition process where we continue to support our students in the community as a degree granting college for, uh, we hope, the next two years, perhaps longer. That's what our plan is. So to be clear, this is not a precipitous closure announcement and we're not moving abruptly or too quickly before there's a chance to consider the decision. Uh, it is our hope that the endowed funds would continue to support a Mills Institute, and we're in the process of reviewing all of those. 
Once the Mills Institute design process is complete, we'll have a better sense of how the endowment will play a role in Mills' future. If you have an endowed fund or have contributed to an endowed fund, you should know that Mills will certainly notify you before making any changes or attempting to make any changes with respect to that fund. Your fund's purpose and administration may not change at all, depending on the specifics of the Mills Institute and on future institutional partnerships. And to be clear, it's not only Mills that intends to do this and absolutely wants to respect um, its donors and their wishes, but it's also because the law, uh, the money that actually we received as endowed funds can only be spent over a, a long period of time. There's a time restriction on that money. That's one reason we can't spend our endowment to cover current operating costs because there's a time restriction on the spending of endowed funds. And the other restriction on endowed funds is purpose restriction. Endowed funds can only be sent for the purpose for which they were, they were given to an institution. And that has to be respected moving forward too. Um, we're, we're bound to that and we absolutely will do that. And that's, um, that's what our advancement team um, is, is, um, is, 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 has done and will continue to do through this transition. Okay, thank you. Um, you already answered some of this question earlier, um, but again, for how long has enrollment at Mills fallen short of goals and why? So there have been a significant shift in uh, where students actually opt to enroll in recent years. There's increasing competition. The students that Mills has um, become actually extraordinarily good at serving well have more options than ever before. Uh, because those students have so many more options, admissions is a very competitive space. One of the challenges that faces Mills in its enrollment climate is the financial challenges of the college itself. The Department of Education publishes a financial composite ratio every year. Um, that, that, help, that is one of many indicators of whether a college is in distress. Like all indicators, it's an imperfect indicator. I just want, just to give you a sense of how this has changed, before 2015, the Department of Education never released those numbers because they viewed it as a substantial competitive injury to those colleges and universities that had actually a number that suggested financial risk. There is a cascade of other numbers that are available today because so many colleges are at risk. Mills is acting before it is in so much risk that we're forced to act in precipitous ways by regulators and accreditors. By acting now, we have much more control over what happens next and we're better able to support our community. So the, the, the enrollment challenges at Mills have created the revenue and the, uh, the financial challenges. And it's largely because of changes across the entire sector of higher education, as well as Mills specific financial situation. So if there hadn't been a pandemic, would enrollment have been different? Everything would have been different. If there hadn't been a pandemic, Nicole, enrollment definitely would have been different. This has had a big impact on everybody. Um, and, uh, and Mills suffered disproportionately in the downturn um, in enrollment this year. Um, some schools uh, were able to, to gain enrollment. Uh, most, many lost some, Mills lost significantly. So yes, the pandemic had a tremendous impact on enrollment and that has a big impact on our judgment about what's best going into the future. Because remember, a downturn in enrollment for one year isn't just, doesn't just affect us for one year. It's the years after as those students, if they're graduate students, not as many, if they're undergraduates, four years, five years, sometimes six years, as students work and meet their family obligations and study and earn their Mills degrees. So that downturn in enrollment that we had last year and that we see coming next year before we made any announcements, that's gonna stay with us and make it, uh, make, make, it, make it impossible for us to continue to meet our expenses moving forward. So given the uncertain future of the college, is Mills still recruiting prospective students? Just today, we heard from a prospective student who was so excited about coming to Mills, a new first year student, didn't, doesn't want to go anywhere else. We are communicating. They know exactly what's happening on the campus right now. We have communicated to all of our students what they can expect. Um, and we're working to give them more details so they actually know exactly what their options are. We want as many students as possible to earn their degrees at Mills. That's the advantage of actually taking this step before we're on the edge of a cliff. We actually want to be able to support our students and community, including the prospective students who join us. Some students uh, take short term, they pursue short term graduate degrees with our with what we anticipate as the timeline ahead. There's plenty of time for those students to earn degrees for the students who aren't on those faster timelines. We're looking at the best transfer pathways for them. We're in active conversation with many institutions to actually enable them to have a streamlined transfer process. And we, uh, we're communicating with individual students. There's not one student pathway through this. There's not one type of student at Mills. There's so many different types of, of, um, of students. Some can accelerate their degrees and we're working to raise support around 
that. And honestly, Nicole, that's what I hope people will help us do here. We need to support our current students so they can earn their degrees, so they can leave Mills with the degree they came here to earn. Many of them will be able to do that with support around an accelerated pathway. And that's the kind of thing that, um, that, that we can use um, support to help.